Welcome back to Hardware Unbox. Today we're finally reviewing the first QD OLED monitor, the Dell Alienware AW3423DW. I know a lot of you guys have been asking for this one, so here it is. But before we get into the main bulk of the review, a huge shout out to our Patreon and Floatplane members who made this review possible. I bought this monitor, it wasn't a review sample from Dell, and the main reason we can afford to spend thousands on products like this is thanks to people who directly support our channel and fund independent hardware testing. Oh, and we also have to thank today's video sponsor. Today's sponsor spot is brought to you by MSI and their new Spatium SSD series. These PCIe 4.0 SSDs utilize the latest 3D NAND flash technology with capacities up to four terabytes and offer incredible speeds of up to seven gigabytes per second for reads and 6.8 gigabytes per second for writes. They feature built-in data security with AES-256 encryption and E2E data protection as well as error correction capabilities that extend the endurance and longevity of the NAND flash storage. You can also migrate data, monitor drive health and performance in real time with MSI Center. And for that extra peace of mind, all models are backed by a five year warranty from MSI. So for more information, please check the link in the video description. So the AW3423DW, here it is. I've seen this described as the ultimate PC monitor, the best gaming display yet, and a product that will kickstart a new generation of gaming monitors. I'm not convinced this is the ultimate display, but we'll get to that throughout this review. Firstly, what even is the AW3423DW? Well, it's a 34 inch 3440 by 1440 OLED monitor with a 175Hz maximum refresh rate. This is the first time we've seen an OLED panel with these specs, and the first time OLED has reached such a refresh rate in a reasonable monitor size. It uses one of Samsung's new QD OLED panels, which are a bit different to other OLED monitors we've seen before, and promise improvements to areas like brightness, efficiency, and burn-in. I'm not going to go into all the details on what QD OLED is and how it works, but fundamentally, it uses the same sort of self-lit organic LED pixels as we've seen from other OLED displays. No backlights are required here. The AW3423DW is fully geared towards gaming, and specifically HDR gaming. It uses an NVIDIA G-Sync Ultimate hardware module, though to be clear this fully works with all GPUs, including those from AMD, even for Adaptive Sync. It also comes VESA Display HDR True Black 400 certified, which unlike the regular Display HDR 400 certification, isn't complete garbage. Using OLED means we get true HDR hardware, and Dell are claiming up to 1000 nits of peak brightness with a 0.1 millisecond greater gray response time. It's also a curved monitor with an 1800R curvature. That's pretty standard for ultra-wide monitors like this, and it feels just right for regular gaming usage. Despite having the hardware to destroy much more expensive products and being one of the only gaming suitable OLED monitors you can buy, the AW3423DW has quite a competitive price point of $1300 US. Now of course this is still relatively expensive when factoring in the entire monitor market, but as far as high end displays go this is significantly cheaper than other true HDR products like the ASUS ROG Swift PG32UQX which still costs $3000. The overall build quality you get is quite impressive, which has also been true of other Alienware monitors. This is quite a large display, not just in terms of the screen size, but also just the general housing. It's a fat monitor in the middle to house all the associated G-Sync hardware, plus it's curved and comes with a large, strong stand. While a lot of the outer materials are plastic, it's a well-built product overall and feels very premium, with tight seams and attention to detail. The front of the monitor is largely black, so black bezels and black plastic, but the rear is mostly white. In fact, it's kind of this unusual two-tone setup. It somehow feels both gamery to a small degree, but also clean and minimalist. I quite like how it looks overall. There's also an RGB LED lighting setup around the central stand pill area, which gets quite bright, as well as an illuminated Alien logo. No complaints regarding the stand assembly, which is strong, supports height adjustment, and can also be tilted and swiveled. Very little movement here, and you can swap out the stand for a VESA mounting adapter if you want to. There are good and bad aspects to the port selection. We get one display port and two HDMI, and a four port USB hub, including two USB ports in an easy to access location on the bottom edge of the monitor. 
The DisplayPort 1.4 port is capable of up to a 175Hz refresh rate, which is good, but you can't use 10-bit and 175Hz at the same time. You're limited to 8-bit here, while for 10-bit you'll need to drop the refresh rate to 144Hz. Personally, this isn't an issue for me as the difference between true 10-bit and 8-bit plus dithering used in the HDR mode is pretty negligible. However, the more pressing issue is the lack of HDMI 2.1. NVIDIA haven't updated their G-Sync module to support HDMI 2.1 yet, which is why it's not included here. HDMI 2.0 limits the display to just 100Hz, which is rather pathetic for a 175Hz display. Not as big of a deal on a 4K display you might want to use with a game console. Today's consoles don't support 3440 by 1440 very well, but still a poor emission on a high-end product. As for the OSD, it's easy to navigate thanks to a directional toggle and includes all the usual color and game features. One thing you don't get here are cheap crosshairs, they would likely burn in on an OLED monitor, but there are black boosting modes and so on. While so far this has been a relatively normal review as far as the design and features go, let's talk about two of the major issues with the AW. 3423DW. The first is the fan noise. This display, mostly due to the G-Sync module again, requires active cooling. The built-in fan runs all the time and it's audible in a quiet room. You won't hear it while gaming with regular game audio, but for quiet desktop usage I could hear it over my PCs, admittedly near silent fans. It also seems to vary its speed at times, giving you periods of louder and quieter fan noise. In my opinion, monitors should be silent, either fully passively cooled or with a fan that's so quiet it's irrelevant. That's not quite the case here, which is a shame for a flagship product. The second issue, and this is perhaps the biggest issue with the entire monitor, is the display's coding. Actually, it's most likely a combination of the coding and the polarization layers, or lack thereof. In short, the AW3423DW reflects a lot of ambient light, and it's quite an unusual sort of reflection, so let me explain. The vast majority of the monitors I've tested fall into one of two categories. Most use a standard matte anti-glare finish. This prevents mirror-like reflections, but does lead to diffuse reflection of ambient lighting, usually restricted to specific areas on the display. Some monitors use a gloss finish, like the LG C1 OLED, which limits a heap of ambient light reflection, but can cause mirror-like reflections for objects directly behind the display. There are pros and cons to each approach depending on the setup and brightness of the display. The AW3423DW uses what Dell describes as an anti-reflective coating, but how I would describe it is combining the worst aspects to matte and gloss finishes. Amazingly, the coating is able to both reflect heaps of ambient light and also provide some mirror-like reflections. This is mostly apparent when viewing darker content. Bright scenes are bright enough to cut through the reflections, and it is especially problematic in brighter viewing environments. Basically, when viewing the screen in standard indoor lighting, blacks will appear grey. And this isn't due to the monitor showing the wrong colour, it's due to the display reflecting ambient light back at you in sort of a dull grey appearance. This is obvious even when the monitor is off, and it appears the QD OLED screen completely lacks a polarization layer, which is usually used to cut down on reflections. So if you buy this monitor and wonder, how come the screen looks a bit grey? Well, this is the reason. How this affects the viewing experience will greatly depend on your usage environment, but when there is enough ambient light, you'll see greyish blacks. And that's a problem, because one of the main benefits to using an OLED is its deep blacks. The pixels are off, after all. But in bright usage conditions, the black level of this QD OLED visually appeared no better than an IPS with a 1000 to 1 contrast ratio. It's only when dimming the lights does the OLED screen start to separate itself from a regular LCD. And when using it in a mostly dark environment, that's where it shines and you get the full benefit of the OLED panel. And yes, this is quite a bit different to how LG's OLED TVs fare in brighter conditions, where even in my bright office, the black levels appeared significantly deeper than any LCD. LG actually does a really great job of ambient light reflection. Now to be clear, this doesn't mean the AW3423DW is useless in bright ambient lighting. In most instances, you'll see a similar experience to an LCD, perhaps with the occasional visible mirror reflection. You just won't get a typical OLED experience here, like you do from monitors that include appropriate polarization. This display is really meant for people that often use their monitor in dim conditions, especially at night, or are willing to adjust their setup to minimize ambient light. And yeah, it looks stunning with the lights turned down.
While we're on the topic of issues, let's get into another one and get it out of the way, which is specific to the new QD OLED panel, and that's the subpixel structure. We've talked in the past about BGR subpixel layouts versus the regular RGB layout and how this affects image quality. Well, something similar occurs with the AW3423DW as the subpixel layout is using triangle RGB, green on top with red and blue on the bottom. As this differs from the standard RGB stripe which operating systems and rendering tools are built around, it causes subpixel rendering issues. The most obvious effect this causes is fringing on high contrast edges. Think the edges of windows or text. Depending on the orientation of the edge, you might see fringing that's any of red, green or blue. And because Windows clear type utility doesn't have built in corrections for this, it's not easily fixable, unlike with a BGR layout. So due to this, the triangle RGB layout is actually worse than BGR for clarity and artifacts. To me, it looks most similar to running a monitor with chroma subsampling enabled. It's not, it's not quite the same as that, but that sort of gives you an idea of what to expect. I've seen various opinions as to how noticeable these fringing artifacts are, with some saying they don't notice it at all, and that may be the case for you as well. Personally, I find it quite easy to notice when using desktop apps, such as when web browsing, even at viewing distances of, say, a meter or more, and I typically sit a bit closer than that. It's especially obvious next to a normal RGB stripe LCD, which may be the case if you plan on using this Alienware monitor next to a second LCD-based display. The drop in clarity moving from the IPS LCD I use every day to the QD OLED was noticeable for things like writing the script for this video. While this does make the AW3423DW less suited to regular desktop usage, the good news is that it's not noticeable at all for content consumption. For gaming or watching videos, I didn't notice any fringing issues, and that's coming from someone that found it obvious for desktop use. I'd have no problems whatsoever using this for gaming, and if that's your primary use case, it's a non-issue, don't worry about it. Before getting into performance, let's talk about the remaining OLED-related concern, which is burn-in. There has been talk that QD OLED is less susceptible to burn-in than other OLED technologies, which is allegedly due to cutting out the reliance on color filters, improving efficiency, so the pixels don't need to work as hard to display a given bright at this stage, it's an unproven claim as the technology is far too new for anyone to have run a comprehensive burn-in test. And I should be clear here that even if QD OLED is less susceptible than other OLEDs, it's still susceptible. There is definitely a risk of burn-in that you should be aware of. How likely is burn-in? Well, it's hard to say, and it will depend on your usage. The AW3423DW does have burn-in mitigation features, including a pixel refresher that automatically runs when the display is put into standby, and pixel shifting. The panel actually appears to be over-provisioned, so the real resolution is slightly higher than 3440 by 1440 and the image then shifts around slightly during usage. These automatic features should help with burn-in, and Dell are also providing a three-year replacement warranty that includes OLED burn-in, which should give you some peace of mind. However, when spending over $1,000 on a display, ideally, I would want it to last for more than three years. I think five years at a minimum is reasonable. So how the QD OLED goes in years four and five is unknown. That's a factor you'll need to weigh up. Personally, I would also recommend burn-in prevention strategies like hiding your Windows taskbar and avoiding long periods of static usage where possible. But for regular content consumption and gaming, it should be a non-issue. Let's talk motion performance now, and as this is an OLED, it's very straightforward, no overdrive settings to worry about. As expected, the performance at 175Hz is excellent, with response times in the 1.5ms range using our stringent test methodology. A tiny minority of transitions had a few overshoot concerns, but nothing at all to be worried about, and of course cumulative deviation results were excellent as well due to the extreme speed on offer with OLED. Also in good news for Adaptive Sync gamers, the performance across the refresh rate range is highly consistent. In fact, there was virtually no change at all when moving down to lower refresh rates, including 60 Hz. So what this means is you get an optimized, consistent experience regardless of the refresh rate you are using. This is a simple, easy case of a single overdrive mode experience, and of course we also get 100% refresh rate compliance at every refresh rate, which is a testament to OLED technology.
Compared to other displays, the AW3423DW offers elite speed, equivalent to other OLEDs we've tested at the maximum refresh rate. This display is almost twice as fast as the Odyssey Neo G9 in terms of best response times. However, the QD OLED also has the benefit of virtually zero overshoot, whereas around 30% of the Neo G9's transitions show some form of inverse ghosting using optimal settings. And that's just a comparison between QD OLED and Samsung VA. A typical high-end IPS, like the LG 34 g 850 is four times slower, and when we start getting to budget VA panels, it's an order of magnitude difference between the two. Typical LCD monitors tend to perform worse at lower refresh rates compared to what they achieve at higher refresh rates, but that's not the case with OLED. Average performance remains extremely consistent, while LCDs move back a notch. But the general placement remains the same, and it's still true that getting the AW3423DW will give you an experience that is more than twice as fast as its competitors, if not significantly more. The cumulative deviation numbers are perhaps the most interesting. Despite the QD OLED response time numbers being equivalent to what we see from LG W OLED panels such as the C1 and FO48U, the QD OLED panel ends up behind in cumulative deviation. This is because the response curves are different. W OLED has a quicker initial response in the first half of the transition, which accounts for most of this difference. But regardless of which OLED tech you get, the results are significantly superior to anything LCD based, and I wouldn't be concerned too much about any of the differences between the OLED tech that we have today. They're all very fast. The AW3423DW is 2.5 times better than its nearest VA LCD competitor, and four times better than today's fast IPS monitors. That's a huge difference that results in a significantly clearer image at the same refresh rate with no ghost trails or inverse ghost trails to speak of. The difference compared to VA LCDs we typically see in today's ultrawides is huge, and the difference side by side is immediately obvious. As this monitor is not using VA technology, there are no dark level performance issues, performance is consistent across all transitions we measured, and this leads to excellent results for dark performance, especially compared to some VA monitors. Just briefly, here are the results comparing every monitor at a fixed 120Hz refresh rate. OLED displays are a class above here and give much better motion clarity. Meanwhile, at 60Hz the same thing is true, although here the refresh rate is slow enough that most displays will be blurry to some degree as all use sample and hold technology. What I found a little puzzling with the AW3423DW was the high level of input latency in terms of processing delay. Seeing the monitor take nearly 5 milliseconds to process is unusual, and while total input latency is okay thanks to a fast refresh rate and lightning fast response times, I think some optimization could be done here to reduce the processing lag. Another contentious issue is power consumption. OLEDs are power hungry, especially when viewing full white images like we test here, which is the worst case scenario for an OLED. Displaying white like this uses around 2.5 times more power than a traditional LCD, although at least the AW3423DW can actually display 200 nits, unlike with the other OLEDs in this chart. However, it's not typical to see 100 watts of power consumption during everyday use, especially while gaming. During typical usage, the monitor hovered between 40 and 60 watts of usage even during HDR gaming. This is still higher than an LCD, but not to as ridiculous of a degree. A significant chunk of this power consumption is actually not related to the panel, as I recorded over 30 watts of consumption even with the display fully switched off showing a black image. Unfortunately, the AW3423DW does not support backlight strobing. OLED is actually quite well suited to strobing from a response time perspective, we should be able to achieve very clear images. However, the major issue is panel brightness. The AW3423DW is not a very bright monitor, and enabling strobing would see that cut down further. I suspect this is why the feature isn't supported, although hopefully future revisions do offer it anyway. Next up we have colour performance. The AW3423DW has a very wide colour gamut, particularly for P3 coverage, hitting 99.3%, which is the highest that I've seen, and exactly what Dell provides on their website. It also extends somewhat into the green range, giving us a decent 97% coverage for Adobe RGB. All up this equates to 80% Rec2020 coverage, not the outright highest I've measured, but very close, giving us great coverage of multiple gamuts. Unfortunately, factory calibration leaves a bit to be desired, especially for grayscale. The main issue here is gamma performance. What this display produces is very wonky, the gamma is too low in the lower range and too high in the upper range, leading to delta E issues. 
CCT performance is actually very solid with no real color tint, but gamma issues do affect image quality. It's also frustrating that gamma performance changes depending on the brightness level, which I think is mostly a tuning issue. The results you see here are captured at 200 nits. On top of this, Dell doesn't implement an sRGB clamp by default, so regular images are oversaturated in its factory configuration. Relative to other monitors, grayscale performance isn't the worst thanks to strong CCT performance, but could have been elite with some attention to the gamma. As expected, color checker calibration puts it in the lower part of the table due to saturation issues. Luckily for buyers, there is an easy way to improve accuracy, and that's using the built-in sRGB mode for SDR use. Now with this mode, many of the other settings are disabled, but the mode itself is functional and does a good job of emulating the sRGB color gamut. However, it doesn't do anything to solve the gamma issues we saw a moment ago, so you're stuck with that unless you perform a full calibration. We did calibrate this monitor fully and the results are okay. Correcting the gamma curve requires a larger than normal amount of work, so there can be banding visible in some gradients relative to monitors that handle gamma better from the factory, but aside from this, calibrated performance can be decently accurate, especially for sRGB and P3 work. The profile we create for these reviews is available for our Patreon and Floatplan members. As far as SDR brightness goes, the AW3423DW is significantly better than other OLED displays I've measured, which are flat out hitting even 150 nits. This Alienware display is still relatively poor for peak brightness, but 240 nits is much better than the LG C1 and very usable in some indoor conditions, provided it's not too bright. The AW3423DW also benefits from not having an automatic brightness limiter for SDR usage. So as you resize windows, you don't get huge changes in brightness like you get with LG W OLED screens. I always found the brightness limiter very annoying and distracting, but that's not a concern whatsoever with the AW3423DW, which hugely improves the usability of the screen as a desktop monitor. Minimum brightness gets down to 23 nits, which is great for users in dark rooms. As for contrast, all OLEDs are self-lit, there's no backlight, so when displaying black, each pixel can fully switch off. This leads to an effective infinite contrast ratio, though for this review we'll show black level instead. This is mostly just to illustrate how other display technologies compare. You'll see that even though VA LCDs can get reasonably dark, they still have a way to go to reach the zero black levels we see from OLED. I was very impressed with the viewing angles from the QD OLED panel, which are elite and surprisingly good for a curved display. This is several levels above what we see from curved VA screens, which can have issues when viewed not in the correct position. There's also no IPS glow here, as of course this isn't an IPS display. I was also very impressed with the uniformity of my unit, and no, it's not a golden sample as I bought this from Dell's website. The color tint was very uniform across the entire panel, which can be an issue with some self-lit panels, and the brightness deviations were minimal. This display looks very even when using, which is great to see. One of the major selling points to getting an OLED display is for HDR performance, which is leagues ahead of the majority of LCD monitors that advertise HDR functionality. Unlike those LCDs, OLEDs have true HDR hardware capabilities, which leads to a night and day difference in terms of real-world HDR image quality. Seriously, the difference is so vast between an OLED for HDR and a Display HDR 400 LCD monitor for HDR that you'd think the LCD monitor was completely broken. The main advantage OLEDs have is they are self-lit. This means each pixel can individually illuminate itself for perfect HDR image quality. LCDs have to rely on a backlight to function, and most true HDR LCDs then use dimming zones to achieve the high levels of contrast required for HDR. Even good full array locally dimmed LCDs with a thousand plus zones pale in comparison to the effective 5 million zones the AW3423DW provides. The advantage this has for image quality does vary depending on the content, but OLEDs simply do not suffer from blooming or haloing around bright objects, which you can get on a mini LED LCD, especially if the zone count is insufficient. Now there are good HDR LCDs out there, but even the best struggle with fine HDR details like star fields or Christmas lights, and the worst panels with only a few zones look downright terrible. No such issues with an OLED panel like this, which looks brilliant in all conditions. Side-by-side -side comparisons really show the differences in these tricky scenes. 
Like with SDR performance, HDR on the AW3423DW also has an effectively infinite contrast ratio. The best we've seen from an LCD-based display is close to 14,000 to 1 in the punishing checkerboard test, and about 13,000 to 1 in our worst case single frame contrast test. Basically, the AW3423DW can get darker and display richer shadows in tricky scenes where bright and dark areas are on screen close together at the same time. The trade-off with an OLED is always brightness. OLEDs are great at shadow detail but poor for bright highlights, while the reverse is true for an LCD-based HDR display. The AW3423DW has two HDR modes that vary the brightness depending on the setting. In the HDR400 True Black mode, Peak brightness tops out around 460 nits for small elements and 280 nits for full screen elements, with no difference between peak and sustained brightness. In the HDR1000 mode, peak brightness now reaches as high as 1020 nits, however full screen brightness drops slightly to 260 nits. When we compare these settings to an LG C1 OLED, there are some clear differences. The Alienware has higher peak brightness, but this is only true for very small elements. At a 5% window size, the AW3423DW drops to 770 nits, which is typically what the C1 can also do. However, the C1 is better at sustaining this brightness for larger elements, providing 770 nits at 10% and 390 nits at 25%. The Alienware is actually dimmer in these conditions at just 464 nits at 10% and 365 nits at 25%. But lower than this, the Alienware regains its lead with superior brightness for full screen images. Neither of these displays holds a candle to the ASUS PG32UQX, which is a mini LED LCD with 1152 local dimming zones. This display powers along at 1700 nits right through to 10%, and only dips to 1200 nits at full screen window sizes. This gives the best LCD based HDR gaming monitor a big lead for brightness at the cost of black levels blooming and tightness of dimming. However, the peak brightness of the Alienware is still great for HDR playback and real scene brightness can be impressive. I measured easily over 800 nits for bright highlights in several game scenes that I tested, with real scene brightness above 1000 nits possible at times. Despite this, in comparison charts, OLED panels do fare poorly in brightness. Full screen sustained brightness is low relative to the best LCDs, and flash brightness isn't any better, as OLEDs typically have no difference between sustained and peak brightness. The quick fall off for brightness also sees the AW3423DW end up last for 10% brightness. I'd really like to see this be up over 600 nits, even if at times you get 800 nits plus for small bright elements. Lastly, we have HDR accuracy, which is a mixed bag. In the HDR1000 mode, the brightness level begins rolling off too soon, so elements that should be of a moderate brightness level end up too dim. In contrast, the HDR400 True Black mode has a tighter roll off. This is especially noticeable at high APL values, so when the overall content level is brighter. The HDR400 mode is okay here, but the HDR1000 mode is well off, and quite a large portion of the range is too dim. So while the HDR1000 mode does provide much higher brightness and is what I'd recommend for HDR gaming, it's also the less accurate of the two modes. A few firmware tweaks from Dell would help here, as there's no reason for this sort of performance, as it should be possible to have both modes deliver the same grayscale tracking just with the HDR1000 mode providing added brightness. On a positive note though, grayscale tracking in the lower luminance range is excellent and better than most LCDs I've seen. This OLED is able to harness its deep blacks to deliver shadow detail right down to a fraction of a nit, which is the limit of my testing tools. Tracking here is very accurate and leads to excellent shadow detail. Color tracking is also reasonably okay, not perfect by any stretch, but at a level where we get the required level of saturation when necessary without oversaturating things that shouldn't be. The final section we have is the Hub Essentials checklist, which assesses whether Dell is accurately advertising this monitor's capabilities, and whether the display meets basic acceptable performance metrics. In the opening section, the AW3423DW does receive a deduction for only including HDMI 2.0, which limits the display to just 100Hz instead of the full 175Hz. However, it sails through color performance well, aside from the usual limitations to the sRGB mode. Dell do advertise factory calibration, and the sRGB mode provides this to an OK standard. Unfortunately, in what may come as a surprise to some, the motion section is not a good result. Part of this is due to Dell bizarrely advertising a 0.1 millisecond response time. I get the idea here was to say motion performance is an order of magnitude better than 1 millisecond LCD monitors, but countering the lies of LCD manufacturers with another lie, 
is still bad. At best, the QD OLED panel hits 0.4 milliseconds in its fastest transitions, but is more accurately a 1.5 millisecond monitor on average. It also gets hit for processing lag, which is oddly high, and not including backlight strobing, which would have worked really well on this panel aside from brightness issues. Obviously, no issues with HDR here as this is a true HDR monitor. Then in the issues and defects section, we do have a few penalties to dish out. No flickering or pixel inversion issues, but this monitor does use a non-standard sub-pixel layout, is at risk of burn-in, and has audible active cooling, all of which are annoying. Overall, this has been quite a long review as there's certainly been a lot to cover. What I wanted to assess here is whether the Alienware AW3423DW is the ultimate PC monitor and whether it's lived up to the rather impossible hype. On both counts, I think it hasn't reached that level, although it's certainly a very good HDR gaming monitor, and for many people, it will still be worth buying. But is it a god tier display? Well, I wouldn't go that far, and in some ways I feel buyers will be early adopting this technology. On the good stuff, the AW3423DW is easily the best HDR gaming monitor you can buy right now. The setup, the hardware, and the performance all points to elite gaming performance. The resolution is perfect for today's GPU hardware, and it has a nice high refresh rate of 175Hz. Response times are significantly better than any LCD, and on top of this, it's a true HDR panel with no visible blooming, perfect black levels, per pixel dimming, and decent peak brightness. This monitor is significantly better than any 34-inch ultrawide that's come before. Previously at the high end, we've had some really good IPS ultrawides without HDR, and a VA model with HDR but with a low dimming zone count. This AW3423DW is much better than any of these options for gaming. It's also better than the vast majority of HDR gaming monitors overall, only falling behind the very best mini LED LCD panels in brightness. It's a practical size, unlike the OLED TVs of today, with a feature set better suited to PCs. And it does all of this at a price point of just $1,300 US dollars, which is insanely good, much better than I was expecting. It's basically like we're getting a high-end ultrawide of old, which used to cost around $1,000, and instead of needing to spend an extra $2,000 to upgrade that into a proper HDR monitor, we're only needing to spend $300. So based on this, I expect it to fly off the shelves. However, there are some pretty significant drawbacks here as well. The AW3423DW is almost exclusively a content consumption monitor. It's great for gaming, great for watching movies, great for TV shows, but it's not great as a desktop monitor for everyday PC tasks. The subpixel layout leads to noticeable fringing compared to the crisp and clean images you get from a top-end IPS, and the screen coding is really disappointing for use in rooms with ambient lighting. Brightness is improved compared to other OLEDs, but it still doesn't get that bright. And despite a three year burn-in warranty, there's always the risk of permanent burn-in during the lifespan of the panel, which will be exacerbated when using it with static desktop apps. I think a lot of people were hoping this would be the ultimate display to use for everything. HDR gaming, watching movies, web browsing, desktop apps, spreadsheets, you name it. But in my opinion, we're not quite there yet. Unfortunately, this first generation of QD OLED panels just doesn't have that level of versatility. But as a content consumption monitor, as part of a setup used mostly for gaming, it's excellent and I'd recommend it for those buyers. I also feel there's a little bit of early adopting pain going on with the AW3423DW. The active fan with audible fan noise, the odd screen coding and layer setup leading to grey blacks at some times, the lack of HDMI 2.0, weird gamma calibration, the teething issues with a non-standard sub-pixel layout. I reckon many of these problems will be resolved in future iterations. There are certainly very obvious and easy targets for improvement that shouldn't be hard to integrate into version 2.0. Don't get me wrong, I still think this display is a great buy for gaming, but I'm super excited for the future of the technology and the next generation of OLED gaming monitors. But hey, we're finally starting to see some movement in terms of getting actual, practical OLED monitors and Personally, I will be using my Alienware AW3423DW in a gaming setup because I think it is one of the best gaming monitors you can get right now. It won't become the monitor that I use for, let's say, video editing like I use my current IPS Ultrawide for, but certainly for pure gaming, I've been really impressed with the HDR experience on this and I can't wait to use it for my everyday gaming needs. 
So anyway, that's it for this one. If you're interested in supporting our in-depth monitor testing, and certainly this has been a very in-depth review, and you want to support us buying more monitors like this to test in the future, please consider supporting us on Patreon and Floatplane. We do have links to those in the description below, and you'll gain access to all the perks, things like Discord community, uh, monthly live streams, behind the scenes videos, ICC profiles, all that good stuff. So thanks for watching right to the end of this video. Hopefully you've learned everything you need to learn about this QD OLED display and I'll catch you in the next one.